Hello, everybody. Welcome to a very special episode of Holly Randall Unfiltered. I am so excited because today I have Dr. Eleanor Yanaga, who is a professor at the London School of Economics. And the reason why I am so excited about having her is she encompasses two of my favorite subjects in the world, sex obviously, and medieval history. I'm a huge medieval history buff. I was a literature major. Um, I graduated from UCLA. Granted, I've forgotten almost all my schooling because porn has rotted my brain, but it is still a part of, of me and my heart. And the medieval period was my favorite my favorite topic. I'm obsessed with the Tudors. Queen Elizabeth I is my favorite historical figure of all time. So this is the time period that really, really interests me. And I think it's also a time period that a lot of people don't know much about um, and definitely are a little bit uh, cloudy when it comes to sex. And I've been following Eleanor on Twitter for a while, and she's always got these really interesting tidbits on discrediting some of the myths surrounding what sexuality and sex was like in the medieval time period. So she's going to educate us all on this fascinating topic. Eleanor, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. It's uh, really, really exciting. To, I mean, you're like porn rotted my brain and I'm like, no, porn is a legitimate <laughs> form of literature and we need to celebrate it. Come on, you know, let's see. I, I, I love that. I feel like uh, maybe you could do a whole dissertation about like how porn is literature and um, oh, I would be really excited about that. My, my thesis was actually um, female sexuality in romantic literature Oh, fantastic. Yeah. So like, you know, studying um, Coleridge and Cristobal and and all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah. That was back when, that was back when I was a little bit smarter and uh, I was (laughs) banging. I don't, I don't believe in like the concept (laughs) of, uh, you know, like there's some kind of like fixed one or the other. I think that we've got a lot of options. That's all. Yeah. Quick question before we start, just because I don't, I feel like I'm not sure if you would have ever attended this because you study a different aspect. Um, But have you ever been to the Romantic Literature Conference in the Lake District? Oh, I have not been, but I'm aware of it. Yeah, like it's a big deal. (laughs) Like, uh, so one of the weird things about like the academic world is like these conferences. And I mean, I can tell you're definitely like on a, you know, everyone will hate me pointing this out, but like uh, we could talk about this on a porn podcast. One of the things that extremely goes down at academic conferences is like everyone gets drunk and shags each other. And this is like, you know, a big, this is like a big part of it that everyone is like, no, that's not real. And you're like, oh, it is. It is. Oh, oh girl. Uh-huh. Oh girl. I went to that conference <laughs> as a student, <laughs> as a guest of UCLA. And let me tell you, uh-huh. I caused, I banged two professors yes. while I was there. Um, I was having an affair with a guy from Boston University and we were banging like every night and we were like, kind of like sorted together. And then this professor from Cambridge came in and I was like, hmm. And so then I got drunk and had sex with him. And apparently I was so loud that everybody in the hotel could hear me. And so like it got back to the other professor. So when I went down for breakfast the next morning, everyone was giving me the evil eye and they were like, how dare you? And oh, then well, the other so professor cool. was so mad that I slept with the Stanford professor. <laughs> it was a whole thing. Wow. <laughs> and it was, and you are absolutely right because like it, everyone's stuck in this, this beautiful area, hmm. but this one hotel and there's a, bar and people just get drunk and just like, and let me tell you something, professors are fucking kinky. Oh yeah. Like this is one of the things where, you know, it's one of these weird things about being a sex historian is that like, in a way you kind of like get sidelined in like academic things. Cause people are like, Oh, are we allowed? Oh, outrageous. Can you actually <laughs> talk about that? But you know, everyone, everyone, it's like the sort of people who sit around and just like, 
read books all the time. Like I'm telling you, there's a lot going on. Um, I mean, Mm -hmm. unfortunately, well, you know, it's not always true, but you know, my big joke about like the medieval history conferences and everyone's shagging each other. I go, yeah, because no one else should shag us because we're terrible people. But you know, it's like, it's extremely what's going on for us, you know, and uh, that's, it's exciting, but you know, now I'm probably going to get blackballed because I pointed it out, but that's, you know, (laughs) but it is absolutely so true. And yeah. And that, that conference is like renowned for those things happening. There's been like several apparently i remember when we first got there i was told that there were several like children born from that conference and then there was a couple of people that got married uh so it was a lot of fun but man those were those were my wild my wild days those were i love it yeah i mean memories. well and i have to say too that ucla is like one of the really really good medieval studies schools too and like literature so it's like mm-hmm. you know that's you know one of the ones that we all go oh yes yes fantastic you know so yeah yeah, there. I I loved I loved UCLA. Um, I remember I had a teacher for Shakespeare, and you know I'd always like liked Shakespeare, but the way that he taught Shakespeare really changed how I looked at it, and um, I enjoyed Shakespeare so much more after that. It's just, you know, education is all about the teachers. It really is. It's incredible how somebody can just awaken a passion in you oh, yeah. in some subject that you never would have thought you would have had. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's, that's how I started out with medieval history too, where it's kind of like, I, um, I went to Loyola Chicago for undergrad mm. uh, and, you know, I was doing history already. And it, w- it was one of those things where it was like, Oh, suddenly you're allowed to kind of pick anything you want. And I just sort of took um, a medieval history unit. Cause I was like, Oh, well, I've never really done that before. And that surely that's interesting. And it was just like over, it was, it was done. It was like over from like my first term of undergrad. I was just like, just indoctrinated and there was no stopping me. So, you know, and now here I am. Look at me today. So <laughs> look at you. So okay. so let's uh let's let's talk a little bit um about you. We spent the first uh five minutes talking about me, which is pretty typical for my show. So uh, <laughs> show. so yeah, I know, but you know, technically it's I'm supposed to be asking other people about themselves. So um uh, tell me how you got into, well, I think you talked a little bit about now about how your interest in medieval history was awakened. So tell me how you got into, um, actually intermingling sex with that. Mm, I mean, like the first part of it is that, um, so my, my big joke is like the things that I do are like a sexuality and like the black death and I do like apocalypticism. And, and my thing of it is, what I always say is that what I study is sex and death because nothing else matters. It's this like, is true. Those are like the two things, right? Um, and I think that you learn a whole lot about a culture by looking at the ways that it treats sex and the way that it treats death. Um, and, you know. Hold on uh, one second. I, sorry, sorry. Ernie, do you hear a weird beeping? like? Pulsing noise. What the hell is that? Is that the Zoom fucking recording? No. Oh, oh! Now I can kind. Of, if I kind of like, do you leave hear it? it? What the fuck is that? Yeah, I can hear that. What the fuck is that? Wait, it just stopped. It just stopped. That was really odd. Also, sorry, real quick, Ernie, can you hear when people text me that, that ding that comes in? um, I heard, for example, um, like, uh, you know what it is? It's my phone is doing some kind of pulsing thing. I am going to. Um, But Ernie, Ernie, did you hear it? Yeah, we can hear you. Of course you can still hear it. You know what? If my phone was doing something weird. That was me. And it, because it was on the computer, it was huh. like vibrating on. Fuck. Okay. It's okay. I only just noticed it. So it's fine. I- um, Ernie, did you hear when that text message came through? You didn't hear a ding? Okay. Fantastic. Well, because if people text me and I, it's like coming through audio wise, I don't know how to like make it because I close my text messages, but it still fucking makes a noise. Oh God. <laughs> how? Uh, 
Oh, okay. All right. Good. I'm glad you guys know more than me. Okay. Okay. We're good. All right. Sorry. Okay. All right. Let me start. Let me ask you that question again. So we can start from the beginning. Okay. Um, Okay. <laughs> so how did you actually fuck? Sorry. One last thing. Ernie, do you think that I should go to, cause I'm, oh no, I am in speaker view. Wait, now I'm in gallery view. Wait, which one am I in? Gallery view. Do you think I should be in gallery view in speaker view so that we can cut back and forth? Oh. Uh, I think it would record the, oh, right. Yes. Ernie, you're so smart. Okay. I will leave it in speaker view. Yeah. 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 So it'll just be like on one person the whole time. Okay. Good point. All right. Okay. So we're, we are figuring again, learning. We are figuring shit out. (laughs) Okay. So how did you arrive at a specific area of study that intermingles medieval history and sex? Um, Well, I I guess there's like two parts to this question. So first I've got like my dry academic answer, which is that the things that I study are like sexuality, um, black death and apocalypticism, because my joke is that the only things that matter are sex and death. So uh, we learn the most about a society, especially when we kind of like look at these things, these super primal things that happen to everyone. And so if you really dig into people's sexuality, you really dig into the way that they relate to dying and things like that. That's when you kind of get to the core of stuff about people. Um, The other half is going to be that um, I think that sex is uh, really great. So I just, you know, I was interested in kind of like learning more about that historically because um, you kind of, the way that people treat sex a lot of the time, it's almost like it's this modern thing that we just kind of come up with just now uh, and that like no one before this has ever kind of looked into it. And, um, you know, it turns out that people were really fucking uh, the entire time and that's why we're all here. And so it's kind of, it's sort of fun to kind of go back to the past and like liberate these people and their sex lives and be like, haha, no, like bring them to the forefront. And I think it's cool, uh, to talk about this as like a legitimate uh, realm of study. It's again, you know, something that like most of us do, uh, in our life, but it's one of those things that you treat it like, oh, well, that's, mm, you don't talk about that though, do you? Oh, you can't really study that. Can you? Well, that's not serious. And I think that it's, important to say no this is serious and you should look into it because this stuff is still kind of influencing the way that we look at the world so it's so interesting because the way that you know what we discuss a lot you know on my shows with adult actors is how much sex does matter to society and so many people want to sweep it under the what rug and don't want to talk about it and don't want to admit that they watch porn and want to believe that there's no um, like connection to society or no influence on society whatsoever. And I think that as we become more progressive, it becomes harder and harder to ignore that porn is a very large part of our society, a big part of our media, everybody watches it. And as porn is evolving, you know, we're using it as a vehicle to discuss like really socially progressive issues. So, I love how you're kind of going into history and looking back at how sex influenced an incredibly important part of human history. And I'm kind of looking at how sex is influencing the present and ultimately across the board, like sex influences society always all the time ever has since the beginning of time and like kind of trying to fight against that, that belief that, that it doesn't sounds like something you and I sort of have in common a little bit. Yeah, definitely. You know, know? uh, I I think that, yeah, it's one of these things where it's like, if we're going to kind of like get um, sex as something that is treated, you know, like it should be like a, just an activity that we all seem to kind of be into and that everyone does. Um, If we're going to get people to kind of uh, just respect porn a bit more, like pay for their goddamn porn. Oh, for the love Mm -hmm. of God. You know, things like this. We can't do that if we're not kind of saying, no, there's a history of sex. There's a psychology of sex. There's like, you know, when you've got the kind of academic framework behind you, then that kind of allows you to push things a little bit further. And I'm not saying that's right. I don't think that like, 
you know, something being academic is necessarily better or proves something. But unfortunately, the people who wield a lot of power or the people who tell you, oh, well, you know, porn is bad and sex is bad and you shouldn't be talking about this. They're the sort of people who are persuaded by like academic arguments. They're the sort of people who are impressed by degrees and that kind of thing. So, you know, you kind of get into them by sneaking through, you know, the university. And that's how you can kind of start shifting uh, discussions in a lot of other ways because I think culturally we are doing pretty well but you still run up against these things where you know just ridiculous attitudes to porn ridiculous attitudes to you know one of the things that I get really frustrated with um in regards to like the, our uh medieval history and uh, the way that we treat porn now is people will be like oh well, you know porn is really changing the way that people have sex and porn is influencing all these like susceptible young children and it didn't used to be this way and i'm like honey let me tell you about the medieval period when everyone is just like having sex in all sorts of ways and it has nothing to do with because they saw a video you know it's just these are things that people do and it's things that people enjoy and you know yeah so maybe you'll get a nudge in a particular direction because of a form of literature but at the end of the day porn's a form of literature and you get to react to it how you react to it and that's not really anyone's fault you know it's it's very frustrating that's my rant. Uh, yeah, I, I know. I love. I love the fact that you know you are able to base, you know, the the fact that sex is has always been a large influence on society, but doesn't necessarily come from, you know, porn like the video porn, like the tube sites, like we talk about in history. So you can look back and say, well, these things you know, maybe these problems that people think that we have with sex and society have been around mm -hmm. for thousands of years. So. Yeah. And I mean, you can also say, you know, we, there's like this big question about like, well, what is porn? Right. Because, you know, mm. it's really easy for us now to be like, well, you know, here you go, like a Google and, and you'll get some um, options, but you know, medieval people were really good at finding things and being like, um, you know, I will make my own porn. I will do drawings of things that I think are sexy, you know, in the margins of a book, it's like, Oh, here's something sexy. But we also know that medieval people would kind of like sexualize like statues or images or whatever that they find sexy. Like there's a whole big thing um, about the cult of San, uh, St. Sebastian um, and St. Sebastian. He's kind of like a gay icon now uh, because the way that he dies, well, one of his, it's not how he dies, but he was tortured because he was, um, tied to a pole and shot full of arrows. And he's like one of the saints that you pray to against plague and stuff. But this means that there's all these statues in churches of like this half naked dude tied to a pole looking kind of like buff. And we know for a fact that people found these statues really sexy. Like we have like a Protestants, for example, after the Reformation writing about this and they're like, oh, Catholics are bad because I remember going to church and being really turned on by um, all the statues of Mary and the statues of St. Sebastian. And I thought those were really sexy. So Catholicism is bad because you shouldn't have um, statues of saints around just like getting people to idols. On. So right. yeah, it's like. So, you know, when I look at uh, Statues of St. Sebastian, I'm thinking about the fact that people were thinking about it as porn, but it doesn't necessarily get me hot, but it was getting them hot. So, like, what, are we going to, we're also going to ban Statues of Saints? That's where, I mean, the Protestants tried it. They're bad. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like, human beings will sexualize whatever they need to, you know? I mean, people find you know, we have these innate sexual desires and we have the, these needs for release, for sexual release. And if we're not getting it in a healthy, balanced way, we will find it wherever. I mean, it's really interesting to look at porn in different cultures and see how like porn is different, like Japanese porn, like hentai porn, mm -hmm. um, you know, with tentacles and like sea monsters, you yeah. know, versus like American porn versus like German porn. And I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's so interesting how cultures influence what different people find sexy. Mm -hmm. Like there are all kinds of uh, like genres of porn uh, here in the UK, um, which I always think is funny as uh, you know, I've been living here for like 12 years now. So a while, but you know, obviously mm -hmm. 
in, as you can see from my accent, I'm American originally. Right. Um, there's all kinds of like genres of porn here, you know, where it'll be like, um, like it centers around like um, having sex in a cab or um, it centers around having sex on a train. And it's like all these things that really exist yes. in, like the British imagination where it's like, oh yeah, it'd be really, it'd be really sexy to go have sex in this train. And like, you know, Americans were kind of like, I trains you know like so we yeah. don't have that same kind of like access to an erotic imagination about the way that we travel but british people are down and uh i, I like that you know it's it's it, it's hot you know come on yeah katie jane who is british came on my show and taught me about dogging which dogging, is something that yeah. i had never heard of before and is not a thing here where people have sex in their cars in like a certain public area mm-hmm. and other people come to watch. And I guess depending on like how far down the window is, that's like an invite yeah. to come in and join or something like that. Yeah. And it's like, um, I'd never heard of dogging in my life before I moved no. here. People here, it's like, uh, it's like, you know, for example, cause I live in London and um, there's a whole part of uh, Hampstead Heath where it's just like an infamous dogging spot. Like people go there to, to dog and that's pretty much it. Um, and you know, which is, and that's also, it's also separate to cottaging, which cottaging is when you, it's mostly for gay men and it's mostly having sex in bathrooms, but dogging um, exists more specifically like in cars or just outside. Right. Um, and you know, I'd never heard the term in my life. Uh, and, the, and now it's like, I'm like, oh yeah, dogging. Mm-hmm. Like there was a thing, there was a pretty bad flooding that we had earlier in the winter. And there was like, um, someone was giving um, updates about the flooding in Cornwall. Like it was a dogging society down there being like, Oh, like watch out for the roads. It's washed out. We're going to have to like call our meeting off tonight. And everyone's like, thanks dogging group on Twitter, you know, like <laughs> helping the community. So we want to see it, but you know, I never. Real, real life, like traffic reports. <laughs> and Americans like having sex in cars. It's not that it's just, we don't, we just don't have the same thing, you know? Um, so Do there are like those cultural differences you can track that I think yeah. is really interesting. I definitely don't like filming sex in cars. I'll tell you that much. Shooting porn in a car is a fucking nightmare. Yeah. Like getting the cameras where you need to go when there's like no room anyway. Mm-mm. Terrible, terrible, terrible. I hate shooting cars. <laughs> but anyways, that's neither here nor there. So, uh, yeah. So, Let's talk about sexually how women were perceived in the medieval period, Um, because contrary to what I think, you know, a lot of people believed that, and I know women were supposed to be docile and they were supposed to be obedient, um, but it seems that a lot of sexual promiscuity was blamed on the woman rather than the man. Is that right? Yeah, that's that's totally correct. So, uh, I mean... Basically, the the synopsis of this is for medieval people, like the medieval imagination, the way that it sees women is that they're the horny ones. Mm -hmm. Uh, like, and that's it, like, end of discussion. It's like, women are the ones who are just like obsessed with sex. They want to have sex all the time. You can't stop them from having sex. And this is kind of in opposition to men who are really logical and cool and can control their desires. It's like, sure, they're interested in sex too, but they're like, they know that you've got to be like chill about it. And there's other things going on in life. They're the responsible gender. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, this like uh, dates back to a lot of things. So in the first place, it's kind of like about, of course, the Adam and Eve uh, creation myth, right? So it's like Eve's the one who eats the apple and she's the one who kind of figures out that they're naked. And so kind of like this whole thing is her fault in the first place because she's like sensual, she's impulsive, and she's kind of the reason that we have to have sex because now we die. Right. Because Mm -hmm. when Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden, they're immortal and you don't need to make more people. So, you know, there are like these debates like uh, that the church fathers will have. So St. Augustine of Hippo, who's one of the church fathers, um, he writes this whole book that he never finishes about uh, the Genesis story. And he's kind of trying to say that there would have been a way for Adam and Eve to generate without having sex and without like the pleasure of sex if they just stayed in there. But he can never kind of like figure out how he can make it work theologically. So women are on the hook for kind of like inventing sex. Um, And then the thing is like culturally, obviously in Europe, I mean, and to be clear, like I'm talking about Europe here, I'm not talking about like China or Japan or, you Mm -hmm. know, the kingdom of greater Zimbabwe, which are all important places in the medieval period, but I work on Europe. Um, So here most people are Christians and 
the church's view on sex is obviously like that it's bad. Um, in their opinion, your ideal person doesn't have sex. Your ideal person will become a priest or a nun if they're a woman and they will focus their minds on God and they will live their whole life celibate and they will never have sex. That's your ideal person. Um, failing that, then you get married and then you only have sex with the person that you married and you only have sex for the purposes of procreation and that's it. Um, and so within that, like there are all these things about women that it just doesn't really make sense because they're like, well, how come women are still horny when they're on their periods? Like, that's a big like question that they always have. They're always like women, they'll, they'll even have sex when they can't, you know, get pregnant. Uh, why there's no purpose to it? Right. Okay. Yeah. Like, why can you, why are women still horny um, while they're breastfeeding when that makes it harder for them to conceive? Why are women, and there's this whole thing about how women are just always too horny and they're too much. Um, why can women, like, why are women, like, having more than one orgasm? That's, like, this whole thing. Because, um, so the idea, the medical idea at the time was that um, in order for women to get pregnant, they have to orgasm too. Because it's, it's like, um, so the idea is, well, if men's uh, sperm is released with orgasm, and if you think about it like a seed, then mm -hmm. women must sort of like release when they orgasm too. So they, they should also orgasm. But then why would she need to have more than one orgasm? And it's just like this burning question, you know? And uh, so on top of that, you know, they hit on this thing where they're like, the other thing that women love is gangbangs. They just love it. They love having like more than one like male who doesn't? I mean, oh, and I'm like highly relatable. I mean, you got me. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> it's, uh, it's like a, it's a thing um, in Cameron, which is uh, written by Boccaccio in the 14th century. And there's this thing where they say, oh, well, um, whereas one cock, and we're talking chickens now, whereas one cock could please uh, 10 hens, uh, 10 men would be pressed to satisfy one woman. And they're just like, mm -hmm. you know, they want a gangbang. They're just going to come all over the place. This is just, you can't stop them. Um, but then the other kind of part of that, other than like the biblicalness, there is like the medical theory behind this and the philosophical theory. So um, medieval people are really into all, everything that ancient people did. So um, they love Aristotle. Uh, they're crazy mm -hmm. for Plato. Um, and a lot of their medical thinking comes from Galen and Hippocrates. And that's where you get the four humor theory. Uh, oh, the, right. All of our bodies have like four, you've got a uh, black bile, you've got yellow bile, you have blood and you have phlegm and they're in balance in your body and they're, you know, dry. And that's and, why they do bloodletting when people are sick, yeah. right? Because yeah. it's like, oh, you've got too much blood, so you got to let that out. So, Which I, like to me still blows my mind because like for sure that is the reason that so many people fucking died when that. they were like being treated. It's like that. That is the worst thing you could do to someone who's sick. Oh my God. But I guess like shit. And someone's like, yeah, what you need to do is just like lose a pint of blood. <laughs> That's really good to take care of it. But I mean, and this, and this went on, you know, like, um, so the medieval period. Oh, like I didn't do this, this bit. Uh, the medieval period technically is like from when Rome, like Western Rome falls in 475 to it's debatable. We don't really know when it, like sometime in the 16th century. Right. Okay. That's, it's like, cause yeah. no one wakes up and goes, oh, we're not medieval anymore. We're early modern now. Like no one said that. Uh, but everyone is doing classical medicine that like the Greeks and Romans were doing. But the thing is it doesn't work, but like, you know, everyone kind of lets, lets Greeks and Romans off the hook. They were pulling all the blood and stuff too. So, you know, they were mad too. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the, so the Greeks and Romans and medieval people all kind of agree that like men are hot and dry and women are cold and wet. And so women are really kind of attracted to men because they're hot and dry because they want to be like warmed up. And so that's also part of the reason why they stay so horny during sex. And they are so interested in having sex for longer periods of time because the idea is like, well, once you finally get something that's like cold and wet, hot, it burns like better. So there's like this whole thing about women kind of being like a wet forest by like the time you light it on fire, it's a forest fire and it's out of control. Um, so like wow. that is like one of the things about like women's libido. And so, you know, you'll see, for example, in the Canterbury Tales, which I know you were saying you, you remember, I was um, trying to was, fresh, I was trying to freshen up on, it's been a long time like, since I've read that. Yeah. The Canterbury Tales, like I really always recommend that people read because, um, they're a bunch of bar stories about sex 
Like mm. people tend to think, oh, well, you know, it's medieval literature. So it's going to be like really pious. It's going to be like high flute. And it's like, no, this is a story about how a woman wants to cheat on her husband who's older than her. So, but he's blind. So she gets her boyfriend to climb a pear tree in the garden and they fuck in the pear tree above him. <laughs> and like, that's how they get around it. It's like, that's what the stories are. And every, almost every single one of them has like some woman who isn't satisfied with her husband. And mm. um, she goes out and has sex with, you know, X number of dudes. It's like a lot of them are, how are they going to figure it out? Like how the the plots that they, they figure out in order to get women to be able to cheat on their husbands are really into cucking. That's mm. Their major thing is that cucking is, is big. For yeah. Yeah. Well, cuckolding is big in porn too, yeah. as we all know from yeah. all those wonderful cuckolding films, which to me are like the funniest thing ever, because it's just always like these two people having sex and this awkward dude who's just uncomfortably going like, oh man, this is terrible. Oh dear. And it's like, you, know it is? you like could, dialogue. you could leave. Yeah, like, I mean, if it's really bad, just, like, go, man. Like, there's a... Yeah. (laughs) And then, like, after... It's, like, how long can you watch a sex... You know, these sex scenes are, like, 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's, like, how long can you watch a sex scene in, like, a dissatisfied manner? Like, the guy runs out of expressions and, like, ways to cross his arms. Just, like... (laughs) It's my favorite thing is just to watch the guy. Just, like, it's just so awkward. It's, like, a specific, like, a talent and such a very specific, like, a calling to be, like, the guy who's, like, honey, oh. Oh, there's, like... There's a very small group of men who do these cuckolding awesome. like scenarios. So there's like you'll see a lot of the same guys. Yes. I mean, and like God bless them because they're out here doing the Lord's work, you know. <laughs> they sure are. <laughs> oh my god. So um so uh, you know it's really interesting that you talked about how the medieval people believed that men and women had to orgasm in order for women to get pregnant. And there's actually been scientific studies that have shown that if a woman does orgasm, then she is actually Hmm. like sometimes more likely to get pregnant. Um, But I didn't know that they even took women's orgasms into consideration at all. Like I wasn't even sure that women were like supposed to have them or if it was like a, a sign of, of bodiness, you know? Yeah. So it's, this is one of these interesting things because like what sort of happens in like the, like after the medieval period. So when we get into the early modern period and like then the modern period is you do get this shift away from like the idea that like women are sexual and they turn into this kind of like, you know, there's this Victorian thing that they'll say, Oh, the angel in the house uh, where it's like, Oh, your wife is perfect. And like, Oh, you just, you you show your dick to her. Just, uh, she doesn't want to see it, but you got to have some babies. Oh, it's terrible. But maybe you have to, yeah, the idea that you have to suffer your wifely duties. Yeah, exactly. And like medieval people are not on that at all. Medieval people are like, Oh yeah. Well, um, the pleasure is kind of like definitely part of it. And they're always talking about like how fun sex is. And so Mm. even like um, theologians, so like the religious people who are like, you shouldn't be having sex. It's very bad. Um, You know, they're always going on about how it's very bad, but you should only be having sex in order to get pregnant. And one of their big things is like, look, make sure that you don't have too much fun during sex though. Like Mm. you shouldn't be like, they they have a big thing where they're like, don't make out too much. Don't make out too much because you might get too turned on. Like, don't like turn, like you need to just like enjoy sex enough that you come and then like, that's it. That's it. But it's got to just be like the most like perfunctory kind of orgasm you've ever had in your life. So they're kind of always being like, yeah, there's no way around the fact that it's pleasurable and God did that so that you would procreate, but like, don't go crazy. Like don't, um, and their kind of version of like, don't go crazy. And, you know, another reason why uh, women are like the horny ones is that they don't want you doing anything that doesn't have to do specifically with getting pregnant. So their whole deal is that like the only kind of acceptable sex is a penis and vagina. That's it. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Blowjobs, no bueno, oral sex, no no bueno. Like no anal sex. That's like a punishable oh. offense, right? Yeah. So, I mean, this is one of the things that's um, interesting too. Like, side note, we'll get right into sodomy because I never stopped talking Oh, about yes. It. I was, wait, hold on. Hold on though. <laughs> yeah. I, I might mean, need to take a commercial break before we get into sodomy. <laughs> I might need a minute. <laughs> I know, right? It's too much. But, uh, <laughs> like, 
there's this, so the way that, that medieval people defined sodomy, and technically this is still true, like the states that still had sodomy laws before they were struck down, you could get done uh, for these things. Technically, sodomy is any kind of sex that can't get you pregnant. And like, that's it. Ah, uh, so, yes. Actually, I think I, I knew that sort of. Yeah, so it's not just anal. Like anal is definitely one. <laughs> like anal's yeah. on the list. But it's like, if you're given a hand job, that's sodomy. If you're giving a blow job, that's sodomy. If you, you know, it's like, there's all these things that are sodomy. Um, a thing that medieval and ancient people were really into was a frottage. So like interfemoral sex, where they like uh, just put a dick between legs and go to town. That was like. A, oh, kind of like a, a sort of town. dry humping sort of. <laughs> Yeah, like, and they were, and they were quite into that. Like, that's really sexy for them. Um, and the, so the thing is that, like, one of women's deals is that they're really into sodomy, right? They're always like, rub my clit, right? And they're always like, oh, go down on me and all this stuff. And they're like, well, you can't get pregnant from that. It's this very naughty, ladies. Like, what are you yeah. thinking? Like, there's also like women are more interested in these forms of sex that are definitely off the cards and you shouldn't be doing. Um, but I mean, spoiler, everyone was doing it every way. And, yeah. you know, and then, so this is the thing is like for sodomy, there's all these different ways to do it. Women really want to do it. And the church people are like, please don't do this. Please just have penis and vagina sex. And so it's like, for them, it's almost the opposite. You know, like a lot of the time now, um, like when people will talk about like, oh, getting a home base or something when having sex, it's like, oh, penis and vagina sex. That's the one, like, that's the, that's the sort of sex that counts. And like everything else is sort of like mm, foreplay and that's it. For medieval people, penis and vagina sex was like the boring one that you like have to do. And everything else was like the good stuff. Like, you know, you were just praying for a blowjob. Like that's what you wanted. Because like that was the horniest, like naughtiest stuff that you could think of. Because it like, was wow. taboo. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. Like, now we're like, no, that's what teenagers do. Uh, like, <laughs> Please start off with blowjobs. Please. Yeah. like. Blowjobs, good. Like penis and vagina sex, yeah. teenage like, pregnancy, no bueno. Exactly. We're just like, please, you know, or you know, like all those um, kids that like Christian schools, God bless them, who say that they're preserving their virginity by having anal sex. And I'm like, okay, uh, you know, I feel like you're wrong, but you know, like it's uh, like have at it. Like if you're having fun, that's all I care. I guess it's like a question yeah. is like, what is sex? So. Mm -hmm. All right. Awesome. We are going to take a quick commercial break and then we are going to come back and talk about so much more sex um, and so much more medieval history. And um, I'm so excited. So uh, hold on, guys. We'll be right back. Than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q&As where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. Okay, so we're back. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about cuckolding because I know that was like a big thing back in the medieval times. And I, my question is, so, you know, there was this whole idea that women were not satisfied with one man and they had to, you know, have sex with other men and multiple men. And I know that there was always a lot of jokes around men being unable to get it up or get a heart on. And obviously back then there was no Viagra. And if you yeah. were unable to produce a child, there was a sense of failure. But I know that at least with like nobility, the failure always fell on the woman and there was serious consequences to not being able to get pregnant. I mean, 
you know, or at least sire, um, a man, I mean, we can just look at Henry VIII's wives, you know, Anne Boylan, like all the miscarriages that she had, her inabilities to get pregnant. And, you know, really, uh, Henry VIII only ended up having one living son um, through all of his wives. And, but it was always the wives' fault, right? And it was never the man's fault. So, I wonder if in that situation, like as a queen, knowing that my life could be at stake, would I possibly consider the fact that it might be the man and go get pregnant by somebody else just so I could produce a child so I didn't get my head cut off? So do you think that any of that cuckolding ever centered around like a woman's, the pressure of a woman needing to get pregnant and her husband being unable to fulfill that? Or do you think it was just women just were really horny? <laughs> <laughs> this, so this is a great question. Um, and there's like, I got a several part answer to this as well, because so the thing is, you know, when we were talking, when I was talking before about uh, cuckolding in the Canterbury tales, like the Canterbury tales is like, um, you know, what you'd call popular literature. So that's like for every man, like everyone on the street is uh, reading those and like telling the stories. There's this whole other kind of literature that happens a bit earlier um, in what we call the high medieval period called courtly love literature. And uh, courtly love literature, as the name implies, is for people who are at court. So like at nights, you know, at like a king's court or something like that. And the entire idea Um, surrounding courtly love literature is it's all about cuckolding women who are married like with women who are married to other men. Um, And the idea is that women, you know, when you're at that kind of level, like when you are a queen or you're a lady, you know, you're a duchess, something like that, you didn't get married because you're attracted to that guy. You didn't get married because you're in love with that guy. You got married because it's a business decision. It's contractual. um, And that is just the way that things work. So you're not in love with him. You know, maybe he's a bit older than you, like whatever. It's just like not your first choice. And what you're doing is you're sitting around in a castle all day and you're with a bunch of other courtiers. So, you know, there's other women there, you know, there's all the ladies in waiting and there's all the men. And basically what it is, is it's a form of literature that starts out of like men writing things to women who are married to like the king or whoever being like, hey girl, you're hot really, I wish I could bang you. And like, it's this whole subset of literature and people were wildly into it. Like it was completely considered acceptable. Um, It was considered that you couldn't possibly even be in love with someone that you're married. Like the two things were antithetical to each other. Like you could, you couldn't possibly love someone and get married. You would have to only love someone that you weren't married to. So behind this, there's like definitely this whole thing about like, well, probably odds are that like women at that level are having sex with other men, like almost Definitely. Now they know they shouldn't. They know that it's bad. Like um, in courtly love literature, for example, like about King Arthur, Um, you know, King Arthur is obviously married to Guinevere, but it all centers around Guinevere and Lancelot wanting to bang. And uh, when Guinevere and Lancelot finally have sex, um, Camelot sort of falls as a result of that. So there's sort of this warning where it's like, I know, I know that you want to have sex with someone other than your husband, but you really can't because, you know, oh, well, but what if, you know, the king has an heir that isn't his and oh, this murky gray area. But, you know, it's probably within the realms of possibility that it was happening. Like we know that there's like this whole court culture that's permissive and assuming that people are having sex. So probably. Um, then on top of that, there's the interesting thing about like, you know, all the stress and strain about like not being able to get pregnant. Um, and one of the things that's interesting about, um, Henry the eighth and his relationship with his wives is like, so the only reason there's like two reasons that you can get divorced in the medieval period that are acceptable. Um, you can get divorced for reasons of what's called consanguinity. Uh, and consanguinity is when it turns out you're like too closely related to that person. And royalty uses this as a get out of jail free card all the time. So um, like Eleanor of Aquitaine, who you might have heard of, was originally the queen of France. And she and her husband just fucking hated each other. Like they did not get on, um, didn't like each other at all. And they managed to petition the Pope to give them a divorce 
because they just hated each other and were going to kill each other so much. And then Eleanor of Aquitaine goes and marries the King of England instead, um, who she also hates and tries to like lead a couple of rebellions against. It's great. Uh, she's a, she was a very cool thing. Um, but so that's one reason you can get divorced. Um, the other reason you can get divorced is that no one can get pregnant because part of the idea when you get married is that you owe each other what's called the marital debt or the conjugal debt. So you have to be able to have sex uh, with the other person because it's just like, well, if I'm going to go to hell, if I have sex with someone other than my husband or wife, they have to have sex with me. Um, and if it's reasonable, the, like the, the thing be, there being that it's reasonable. So yeah, you could probably get pregnant and you know, everything else is, you know, taken into court. Like, you know, you have to kind of like give it up and have sex with people. So a big way that people get divorced is if their husbands are impotent. And like, this is a case that goes to court a lot. And the way that they will test this is that like a woman will go to court and she'll say, my husband can't get it up. And the court will say, oh yeah, prove it. And what they'll do is they'll go get a bunch of sex workers um, and they'll get the man. And like, this has happened in Scotland. We've got this documented as a part of court record. They go get a bunch of sex workers who like get naked in front of the guy and take turns like jacking him off and stuff. And then when he can't like get it up, they're like, yeah, definitely this guy's, this guy is is totally impotent. You gotta let her go, mate. And like she's getting a divorce because he can't get it up. And, and this is, I assume, like in front of an audience, right? Yeah. And it's like so like it has nothing to do with stage fright. And let me tell you something from somebody who shot a lot of porn and for a time period had to shoot like amateur couples for a playboy. Oh. Like when men are in, get that stage fright and they're, right. they have that pressure on them and they're in front of other people. It is very hard to get it up. Whereas at home, like in the privacy of their own home, they're fine. So of course these things were not taken into consideration. Plus on top of that, you've got the like, and also if you don't get it up, your wife's going to divorce you. It's like- And everybody's going to know why. You know why. And so you're like, oh no. So like in the kind of um, early modern period, when you sort of switch into like um, witchcraft ac- accusations and stuff, which it's not really a medieval thing, like the whole witchcraft accusation thing is early modern technical standpoint. Um, that is like one of the big things that women get accused of doing is like uh, casting spells on guys to like make them impotent. They're like, oh, because and, and it is like this dangerous thing because it does mean that you can break up your marriage or something if you can't get it up. Um, obviously, though, like you're not going to be able to do that if you're married to the King of England, right? Mm-hmm. Like no one is going to be like, well, okay, Henry, like drop your trousers, let's go, you know, like let's let's see. Yeah. Like you can't, so like that's all well and good for average people or normal people, but those rules don't apply when you're the king. And like, I mean, that's what kicks off the Reformation here. That's why, you know, like the Tudors, it's like, oh, are they early modern? Are they medieval? Because Henry is the one who's like, okay, well, that's if you won't give me the divorce that I want in order to have uh, kids, which is what, you know, he thinks, I mean, he also just kind of like doesn't like a lot of his wives, let's be real. Um, Mm -hmm. Then, well, I'll leave the church. And you know, that's, you know, how you get the Church of England and stuff. So right. it works that like kind of like switches the onus onto women. Um, and there is a lot of that around because there is this whole thing about like, you have to be able, the reason that marriage exists is that it's about getting heirs. It's about um, getting pregnant. It's about having children. Um, and it's about like kind of securing the dynasty and securing the legacy. But we do, interestingly enough, in the medieval period, see a lot more um, that it's the dude's fault than women. But it all bets are off if you're talking about the king because when, the king's the king. Okay. Yeah. And nothing's ever his fault. Yeah. Never. Yeah. Oh, he's such a bastard, Henry Dave. Oh my God. Yeah. I know. I know. I, I am. Anne Boylan is actually another one of my favorite characters, which makes sense Henry. because she's the mother of Queen Elizabeth I, my favorite person of all time. And um, so, yeah, I've read, uh, I actually just listen, finished listening to, I don't know if you listen to Noble Blood, hmm. yeah, the podcast, but I just listened to, uh, they, they did one on Anne Boylan and I've, I know her story inside and out because, you know, I've, yeah. I, 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 her. I like her because I like how she managed to like get to the top by only being like sexy and clever. And like, that's yeah. It. And then, it, it, but it's also this interesting story about like the limits of what that is, mm-hmm. and, you know, but you can't be too sexy and clever because eventually you can't be sexy and clever and not give him a boy. Yeah. And that, if, then if, you're fucked. Yeah. If Elizabeth had been a boy, like it would have been all systems go, you know. But also too, like Elizabeth ended up being one of the greatest monarchs oh, of, 
I'm I like, mean, she like started the golden age. I mean, she was, you know, yeah, she like, was, she was incredible. She was so formidable. And mm-hmm. I'm, I mean, I think that it's really interesting because like the way that people used to relate to Emily before Elizabeth came to the throne, they were like, oh yeah, yeah. Like that French witch, like she was a terrible mm-hmm. person. Um, and then like Elizabeth comes around and they're like, never mind. And you get like, yeah. this kind of, like a big, um, this big change, uh, into like the way that we look at her. And I think that we're definitely, I think that's a, definitely a, a thing now as well. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're kind of like a team man at this point, or at least I am. I love her. Yeah. Although, I also think that, uh, Catherine of Aragon, Henry as first wife was a really cool yeah. thing too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, man. This I mean, that woman was, <laughs> that woman, if nothing, if nothing else was not, was consistent, yeah. you know, and, um, and, you know, proud and, uh, un, unfaltering in her belief in, yeah. you know, her place in society. But what I, what I think is interesting too about Queen Elizabeth I is that the only way that she was really able to hold on to power was to remain the virgin queen mm-hmm. and to not, to completely, you know, um, stay away from sex because that would have, you know, and marrying another man and producing an heir because that would have been her downfall. Yeah. Because it's like a four, the whole thing about like having a queen is that it was like sort of acceptable if you couldn't get a dude. Like, yeah, but she needed to marry a man. Yeah. And and the minute she married a man, it would be, you know, it it doesn't happen like that anymore. Obviously witness Queen Elizabeth II, who we have right now, she's the queen and that's it. But at the time, if she got married, it'd be like, okay, yeah, well now he's the king. And it's like, well, she doesn't want to be sidelined. She's too much of a badass. So, I mean, uh, yeah. And, and she gets a lot of stuff done by like promising to marry people or being like, Oh, I might marry you. You don't know. And then everyone goes, Oh, okay, great. You know, and makes alliances with her. But, uh, you know, on the real, she was having sex just, you know, yeah, not in any way that would lead to marriage. So bless her greatly. Right. Bless her. Bless her. <laughs> um, okay. Let's talk about sex toys in the medieval yes. period. Yeah. Because these things existed. Mm-hmm. So, um, one of my favorite things, uh, that medieval people were really into is dildos. Uh, and, uh, this is like one of these, these great things because, you know, again, like a lot of the time when we think about like sex toys and stuff like that, we go, well, this is like the super modern thing. Um, you know, there's like that myth that, uh, vibrators were invented by Victorian doctors to masturbate women. It's not true. Sorry. They just were invented because they're cool. Uh, it wasn't doctors who did it to like, calm hysteria. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, that's, that's a myth. It's a great myth, but um, it doesn't exist. But so obviously medieval people couldn't have vibrators, but we know that they had dildos. And the reason that we know they have dildos is, um, well, there's a couple of different sources, right? So one of them is this thing that's called, um, a penitential. The penitential is like a guidebook for priests um, so if you, um, are a priest and you're going to give confession to someone, you'll have this little penitential. And so maybe they're not like forthcoming. They're not telling you all the sins that they have. It's got like questions you can ask them to be like, Oh, how well have you done this? So that they will have to like, you know, admit that they've done something wrong. Um, and it also tells you like what you should give as penance. So like the punishment for when you've done these bad sins. Um, and there's this one that it dates, I think, uh, to the eighth century by a uh, Bouchard of Worms, who was like a bishop. And he writes in this penitential and he says, well, a thing that you should ask women is if they have fashioned something in the shape of the male member to a size, uh, to fit their, um, their infernal imagination. And infernal imagination. Yeah, and it's like, so that's a great word. I feel like that's just a wonderful word for a vagina. Yeah. Like, like my infernal imagination. imagination. And so, you know, and what he means is like, are you making dildos? Right. Um, and, and then, you know, and then he says, and like pleasuring yourself with them. Right. So it's right. really clear. He's talking about making things like shaped like a dick. Right. Um, and it's like, if so, you're very naughty. Um, you should fast for like, I think it's like a year or something on Sundays and uh, feast days, which also sucks. Cause that means like, you don't get to like have the big feast at Christmas and everything. Boo. Mm-hmm. Bad, bad penance. We don't like it. Um, but then the next thing he asks is like, and have you taken that and have you fastened it about your hips with straps, um, in order uh, to do so to another? So then the next question is like, are you using it as a strap on? Wow. 
So it's not just like, a, and it's like, it doesn't make it clear. Like if you're doing it to another woman or like maybe you're pegging, I don't know. But they right. also like, there's also this really clear evidence that like, yeah, people are making strap-ons. And the thing about penitentials is they're really difficult because they're like written by these celibate dudes who are priests, right? So you don't know if like it's necessarily something that's definitively happening or if this guy's like, oh, I bet they're making dildos to <laughs> like, you know, like ask them, I'm going to ask them about the dildos. Just jerking off thinking about other people making dildos. Exactly. And just like, oh, were you, were you doing it? Were you a naughty girl? Were you a naughty girl? Did you make a dildo? Oh God. Like, so that's like one side of it. So, you know, you right. Think, all right, well, this is just like some horny dude making stuff up. But we have the receipts, literally. So like we have actual receipts that last from, I think this is somewhere in the lowlands. So it's like Holland or Belgium or whatever, which is like some of the richest part of uh, medieval Europe. And there's this leather maker who made a leather red, a red leather dildo with like a strap on for some woman. And it's like, it's not that he made it. It's that it's red that I like. Yeah. I like that. There's like this erotic kind of like aesthetic going on there too, where it's yeah. like, I, don't, I just don't, I don't just want like a strap on it. It's got to be red. Like, okay, that's yeah. what I want. And it's really nice to be able to have that because the thing is, you know, dildos aren't like an object that really survives particularly long because it's like, you're not going to like leave it in your will. You're not like, oh, um, I leave. <laughs> I bequeath my dildo, dildo to my son. Yeah, like, please take care of it. You know, I hope that it means as much to you as it meant to you. That's not from this that. dildo has been passed down <laughs> through the family for generations. Your great great grandfather would have wanted you to have it. <laughs> I, you know, I, wish, I wish that stuff did happen, you know, but it's like. We, so we lose them. Like, we lose the dildos along the way. And so it's really easy to go. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's a great book title. The dildos we lose along the way. <laughs> just a memoir, you know? <laughs> just, oh, my God. Well, I need to write that down. <laughs> do it. I'm, 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 I'm trying to read this book, so please uh, go for it. <laughs> um, yeah, so like you, we. It's hard when you're like, because the thing about doing history is that you can only do it on what you have. So you can only like have the written text that you've got. You've only got like the dildos that get found, right? And you know the dildos <laughs> don't get found, right? They don't. We have now. We have tons of like uh, Victorian dildos now. We got Victorian dildos all over the goddamn shop, and this is because. Um, there's this guy, Henry Welcome, here in London, who was like a really rich, um, I think he was in pharmaceuticals or something like that. Um, there's a museum here now. Um, and he was like massively wealthy and he would go all around the world. And one of the things that he would collect is dildos. Um, and he was just like totally into dildo, just just like dildo mad, like collecting all these dildos. And they got them and they will put them on display over at uh, the Welcome Collection, which is amazing. But like, uh, he eventually got himself divorced because he was like such a mad collector of things. And his wife was like, you know, I swear to God, if you bring home one more dildo, like, and he's all like, oh, uh, what's that behind your back? Nothing. Is that another dildo? God damn it. That is it, Henry. Like, I'm out the door. And like, so... <laughs> We've got like, well, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating, hundreds, hundreds of Victorian dildos. And they are like all these interesting ones that are real, like, you put water in them and then you, you can make them squirt to like simulate ejaculation. Oh and my God. They were like making fancy dildos. They loved it. They loved it. And so, you know, again, it's easy for us to go, oh, well, this is a modern invention. Cause like, look at all of Henry Welcome's dildos, but it's like medieval people also had them. They just... We just didn't have a Henry Welcome like stash of them. <laughs> we didn't have a big dildo collector back then. I know. What would they have? What would they have made them out of? Like wood or? We definitely know that they made them out of leather. Uh, as I say, um, we think that they made them out of clay. Um, it's kind of like it's, some of the penitentials kind of like they'll use specifically words like mold and things like that. So it's like, well, okay, you would just like make a pottery dildo. I don't know. Um, and then you know, there's like. There are glaze that like, shit. Well, or it'd be fucking uncomfortable. I know. Think about that. Like ceramics and like when you can't guarantee the fire quality on that. I don't know, man. I don't even want to think about it. But uh it gives well, you a whole new perspective to that scene in Ghost. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, it could have been it could have been beautiful. You know? <laughs> uh, 
But like definitely leather, I think is is one of the big ones, which mm, you know for us extremely porous, not not ideal, but you know not easy to clean. No, we don't like it. But uh, you know they're doing they were doing what they can. So with the materials provided, but they're a hundred percent like go to town on on dildos, and you know we know also that they are kind of kinky, um, mm. like beyond that. Like so they've got S and M interests as well. Is like a thing. Um, they'll write all the time about um, their relationships where they'll like kind of spank each other and hit each other. Um, like there'll be a lot of things about like um, a lot of times, uh, you know, relationships between kind of like masters and students, there's like references to like, Oh, well, when he would hit me, I knew that it meant that he loved me. And there's like a lot of like very clear, like getting off on the pain there. Mm. Uh, a lot of kind of like thinking erotically about um Thinking erotically about Jesus on the cross is a thing that happens. So, you know, again, if you're, if you're looking for kind of like half naked images, like the one that you can really reliably get is in every church. Yeah, that's so true. Uh, and there are like a lot of people, you know, and they're saying, well, this is a religious vision. This is an ecstatic vision I had. Uh, and Jesus came at, down off the cross and then we started making out. And, uh, you know, and I like caressed his wounds and all this stuff. It's like all this like aftercare stuff about like, Jesus's wounds and like making out with him really hardcore. And, you know, you and I read that and we're like, this is kind of like horny. And this is clearly like your like weird erotic fantasy. And they're like, yeah, about God. And it's like, yeah, but this is, this is sex. And they're like, mm, yeah, but it's about God. So I think it's kind of holy. And you're like, okay. Yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, nuns were married to the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. And I guess they can have all the sex they want with God. They have visions about that and they write about that. So it's like, there are people who will have these visions. uh, Nuns will have visions, especially of like Jesus coming off the cross again. And they give them, and then he gives them a wedding ring made out of his foreskin. Because uh, there's like you know there's a big obsession with Jesus's foreskin because he's Jewish obviously, um, right. so he's circumcised and um, like it's uh, I think it's, so it's called the precipice of Christ and there's like seven different churches around Europe are like oh yeah we've got Jesus's foreskin or something now just like there's a ton of them that exist but these nuns would like have these visions where Jesus comes and marries them gives him them his old foreskin as a wedding ring and then like they bang. Um, or there will be people who have ecstatic visions, nuns who have ecstatic visions. And it's like their whole convent has like an orgy with Jesus essentially where like, again, Jesus shows up and then they talk about like how, um, they're all, you know, they're all united together in ecstasy, you know, and, and all these things. And we're just like, "Mm." but if you like, if you do it with Jesus, then it's chill. Then it's like divine. It's right. Yeah. So it's like an acceptable sexual fantasy to have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they, and they have it and they love it. Like that's what they are about that life. Um, so a lot of, um, I mean also, and then we have like these private weird erotic things that happen. Cause like, you know, one of Jesus's wounds, you know, when he gets killed, he gets a lance through his side. And a mm-hmm. thing that shows up all the time in um, books of hours, which are like little uh, books that rich ladies have that have like prayers that you pray in them, but there will be pictures of the wound of Christ and the wound of Christ looks surprisingly like a vagina or like a vulva. So it's like this, it's always like this um, wow. and it's kind of like painted and there'll be like gold. And we know that people are taking this and they're like kissing it and they're stroking it because we can see where the pigment has like worn off. So they're like kissing and rubbing this thing that just, it looks like a vagina. You can go ahead and call it the, the side wound of Christ all you want. It's not like showing it on Christ. It's just a vagina looking thing in a book. Right. And yeah. Or they're like there, they're just like kissing it for just giving it a rub. Just, huh. so again, it looks porn, right? Yeah. Because it's like, yeah. are your like a daily devotions when you're thinking about the suffering of Christ porn? Because for medieval people, they were a little wow. bit. That's really interesting. I want to go back to what we were talking about with um, when we talked about dildos and like, uh, you know, how they were difficult to sterilize. It reminded me of a tweet that you actually made about how there's this misconception that people in the medieval times never bathed. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the idea of, you know, them having sex with each other is kind of disgusting because 
you know, yeah, they yeah. smell and all of that. And, and that is something that I personally thought was true, but, uh, you said that's, that's, that's not true. And then you mentioned wow. the bathhouses, which I realized I hadn't thought it, which is true. That was like a big thing to go to the bathhouse. Oh yeah. And it was like, that is luxury. So, you know, um, they would go, uh, usually that, you know, you'd go to the bathhouse regularly. Um, you know, maybe that was once a week, maybe it was like once a month. It depends on what you can afford. And like the bathhouse is a really nice time. And it's something that people really enjoy doing. It's like going to the spa now. Mm -hmm. Uh, and any city is going to have like a number of bathhouses because like, this is good business. So you would regularly go there. And that's because, um, you know, it's really hard to heat a bunch of hot water if you don't have, you know, indoor plumbing and it's really labor intensive. Um, water's really heavy. If you're actually like lugging it around and like getting that all going with a fire and everything, it's really frustrating. So, you know, obviously your average person doesn't have like a bathroom that's got a bathtub in it. Um, But what they would do is they would wash with soap and water most days, just kind of like do a sort of scrub up, you know, wash your your face, wash your armpits, you know, wash around. And then you go for your big bath um, as much as you could afford it, essentially. Um, in the summer, people would go swimming and that sort of thing. And that was like a way of bathing too. You do that. And we know that they did that and they really like that. They write poems about how much fun it is to go swimming and how much they enjoy baths and this sort of a thing. Um, but the reason that there's this kind of like myth that it's medieval people is that early modern people definitely go off bathing. Um, and the reason for this is that bathhouses in the medieval period are also a lot of the time brothels. Um, and so uh, sex workers in the medieval period, a lot of the time work out of bathhouses because it's like, um, a, well, so you're doing something nice for yourself. Are you like getting a sex worker? Are you like, it's a special treat. Oh, well, it would be really nice if you could like combine that with a bath because baths are the most fun and the most nice. So you go have like a real nice bath. You know, she washes your hair and all the stuff you have sex. It's like a great time. Um, Also within this is even if you're not in like one of the brothel bathhouses of which like there's tons, um, you're still in a space where you're kind of naked and wet with people of the opposite sex. So there's like a lot of like being nude and it's like, Oh, that's kind of sexy. Right. So they weren't separated by gender. Mm -mm. So Mm. it's like, you'll have like, sometimes the, uh, you'll have kind of like maybe like curtains around places that will like mark it off. But there is a lot of like being like half naked and like giving each other the eye and this sort of a thing, Mm. sneak into tubs with each other. And there's always complaints about this. There's always complaints about how it's too sexy down at the bathhouse. It's too sexy. Uh, (laughs) And like someone should do something about it. Right. Um, So there's a lot of that happening. And then you get, in the early modern period, when Protestantism and everything comes in, you get the move towards Puritanism. Um, you get this like, we have got to close these bathhouses. Uh, they are full of sex workers. Everyone's just having sex all over the place, even if it's not with sex workers. It's like this really sexy space. We've got to shut it down. Whereas medieval people were like, yeah, you know, a little bit of bathhouse sex. And so, yeah. for example, here in London, all of the bathhouses were in what is now Southwark, and they were called the Stews. And there was like the series of uh, roads that don't exist there anymore that were all called like um, Maidenhead Lane and like, uh, you know, and and very seriously that we had a Grope Cunt Lane here in London that doesn't exist anymore. You know, it's like they were not shy about telling you. You had a what? What was the last one? Cunt. Wait, one more time. Grope Cunt. Grope Cunt. Cunt. Grope Cunt Lane. Uh, And that is amazing. And it's, it, re- it was really, really common throughout England. And now, like, the clue, if you're ever in English towns, if something is called Grape Lane now, like, everyone kind of, like, changed it from being Grope Cunt. But in the medieval period, it's like, oh, that's where uh, I'll go if I want to grow up a cunt. Good. Uh, you know, like, they would just name streets after what you bought there. And there you go. So... Henry VIII, when he gets his divorce, because he's just, you know, like, well, when he, like, starts the Church of England, because, you know, not, it wasn't about divorce. No, it was about his deeply held religious convictions, you know. Um, right. He closes all the stews because he's like, oh, we got to, like, clean this up. Can't just, like, uh, have um, all of these bathhouses with all these people having sex. So he closes them all, and everyone is like, oh, well, fuck. Where am I going to bathe now? Because it's like, sure, sure, people were having a bunch of sex in them, but people were also using them to bathe. So it makes it harder. And you see this all over Europe. You have like all the public bathhouses kind of start closing down. And suddenly it's just like incumbent on you to figure out how to wash yourself 
like in the house that you share with six other people where you're kind of like looking for privacy. You don't know how to do it. And so it's the modern period where people stop bathing. Uh, but the medieval period, they were into it. And it's actually like not about when people stop bathing. It's not necessarily like a health thing. It's a moral thing. So it's like all the bathhouses get closed down because you shouldn't be having too much sex. And medieval people were like, I don't know, treat yourself. Like, <laughs> why not, you know... <laughs> What are you gonna do? Yeah, life's hard, man. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, like, and and the thing is, though, like, sex work is way more prevalent in the medieval period. It's seen as being uh, necessary. It's like, uh, so it was uh, it was legal then. Yeah, yeah. So it wasn't decriminalized. It was legal. So, um, like, again, here in London, you know, you could be a sex worker in the stews, right? So you could do it in the bathhouses. That makes it legal. But we have records, for example, of um, sex workers working in like the wrong part of town. Like the idea a lot of the time is they'll say, well, you've either got to, all cities have walls at the time uh, because, you know, in case like an army sneaks up or something. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, a lot of the time they'll be like, okay, you can do sex work, but you got to do it outside of the walls. You can't do it. it or, okay, you can do sex work, but you got to do it like right up against the city walls. You need to be at the edge of the city. You can't be like in the center of town. Like mm -hmm. uh, can't go doing that. So here in London, most of it was supposed to take place in Southwark because it's across the river. So you cross London bridge or you get a little boat over and then you go and you have your bath, you have some sex and you come home. Um, so we know that there are sex workers who were like, yeah, no, fuck that. I'm going to work where I want to work. And when they get caught, there's like this whole thing of this uh, one woman gets caught and they strip her to the waist and they like march her through town with like drums. And they're like, come look at this woman. She was doing sex work in the wrong place. And they march her down Cheapside and across London Bridge and take her to the stews. And they're like, this is where you do sex work. This, you stay here. And although there are a couple of places after Henry uh, closes the stews up in town where like there's a love lane, that sort of a thing where it's like, again, near the city walls. And it's like, okay, well, this is where we'll move the brothels because you're still going to be, I'll be, we still need a brothel or two. Come on, come on. Like, right, be, right, right. We crack down on them, but you can't get rid of them. Um, but medieval people were like, no, you're going to have to have a brothel because uh, if dudes, and this is where it gets weird because it's like, well, women are the horny ones, right? But if dudes don't have a sexual outlet because they're not married or something like that, the idea is that like their lust will build up inside of them and it will drive them nuts and they'll lash out violently and like start a riot. So um, it's like, it's suggested so it was necessary for like crowd control. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, you've got to have bubbles where these dudes can just like get some and just like not burn the joint down. So, um, you know, a lot of medieval cities, for example, they'll have municipal brothels where it's like, you go to the city and you go, Hey, uh, I was thinking about setting up a brothel and they'll go, oh, okay, great. Here's your charter. Off you go. Right. And like, mm -hmm. or there will just be like people who are doing sex work and it's fine, but it's like, there's usually just like rules. Like you got to do it across the river. You got to do it. At the wall, you've got it here in London. Sometimes they would make uh, sex workers wear these things called hoods of ray, which are like black and white striped headpieces. And they huh. like, so you have to like, everyone has to know you're a sex worker. Uh, it's like, right. So there's all that. But also it's interesting because there's a lot less stigma about sex work too, because it's like the penance for if you want to get out of sex work is uh, the priest usually tells you, yeah, we'll go get married and start a family. And then that's all you gotta do yeah it's like that that's it because they're like oh well you're you've been like serving the community like you were making sure that dudes didn't burn the joint down thanks like great great job oh so what like, a crazy thought that they were like more progressive in the way that they looked at sex workers back in the medieval period yeah. than they are now yeah it's like there's 100 percent like way more chill about it so it's like you know it's not ideal you know there are rules about how you've got to do it but there's more of a place for sex work in the medieval world. Like sex workers are considered like indispensable. It's like, you know, how necessary we workers. Yeah. Like yeah, definitely their key workers are like, no, I'm sorry, honey, you better get out there. You know, like this is, and now we are kind of like, Oh, well you should be able to not have sex. And sex workers are always like, uh, you know, these people to kind of like be shunned and, you know, uh, and Oh, you've got to like, Oh, poor, poor you, you poor thing. Why'd you get into this? Like for many women, sex work is a lot of the time, like the way to go, like 85% of the European population are peasants. Right. And right. Like, you don't want to be on the farm. Like the only options that you really have are like to go be someone's maid 
or to be a sex worker. And so if you're like, well, I want to determine my own life, like sex work is the one that women can do. So um, they're real badasses. Like you can, you can be, you can make a lot of money um, in medieval London as a sex worker. You could be running a bathhouse in no time and like just relaxing and like watching the money roll in. So it's, you know, for the enterprising businesswoman in the medieval period, it's like sex work is the way in, right? Not allowed to do anything else, right? So may as well. Wow. Yeah. I mean, women's options were definitely limited back then. Yeah. But I love the fact that they had a more liberal view of, of sex work. It sounds like it sounds like we could learn something from the views on sex workers in the medieval period. That is how I feel. So and I'll never get tired of yelling about it. <laughs> well, we love that. Um, this has been amazing. We've actually, we've been talking for more than an hour, if you can believe oh, it. Oh, wow. Oh, there you go. I know. I've actually noticed I've been watching the light changing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. You're in, um, it's this time of year in London because, you know, so I'm eight yeah. hours ahead of you. Um, and like yeah. it, the daylight is really fast, but it's now, yeah, it's after eight. So like it's changing. Yeah. Like we're, we're, gonna, we're getting on the light time, but not yet soon next month. Like the, uh, light will be up still still at like 10 30 11 it's crazy up here yeah that's what i actually i love about um going to england in the summer is how it's light Light. until so late it's incredible Mm -hmm. it's really cool yeah but it sucks like in the winter yeah it's a yeah in the winter it gets a little wild but uh you take your vitamin d you know it's like it's (laughs) fine i'm from Seattle, so it's like i barely know any better anyway i'm just like what light in the winter (laughs) why why would you need that i don't know so Well, thank you so much, Eleanor. This has been really, really awesome. This has been just as fascinating as I expected it would be. So such a pleasure to be on. Um, I'm, you know, such a huge fan of the podcast and everything. So it's like, yay, me too. (laughs) (laughs) Can you tell everyone where they can find you like on social media? I know you have a blog that you write. At Twitter, I am at going medieval. Easy very easy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm yelling there all the time. So, you know, um, I have a problem and I should really log off, but it's fine. Um, I also have a blog, which is going hyphen medieval.com where I write all about the stuff in like, like the major thing I write about is sex. So you know, if this wasn't enough for you, uh, check that out. Um, I've got a lot of stuff there. Um, and I'm currently writing a book about, uh, this as well. So hopefully that'll be out in the next year or two. So, um, which is going to be, for just like a general audience, not academic, I'm just going to talk about medieval sex and what medieval people thought was a hot woman and that sort of thing. Is it is it going to be called the dildos that we lost along the oh way? My God, you know what? Actually, be like the subtitle because I think at the minute it's it's going to be called the once in future sex, and I should be like colon the dildos we lost along the way. <laughs> I'm going to tell my agent. He's going to say no. I'm going to cry. <laughs> um, <laughs> beautiful Beautiful. oh god i love it all right well um yeah that was fascinating let us know when your book comes out for sure and i'll definitely plug it i think people are going to be really interested in in reading something like that um the the combination of of history and sex is always so interesting you know it reminds us that just uh it's been a part of human nature for as long as one can remember i mean absolutely we are not the ones who invented it so no we are no (laughs) All right. And you guys can follow me at Holly Randall on Twitter and on Instagram. If you want to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you again, Eleanor. Stay Thanks safe. You too. Um, I hope one day okay, we get to leave our houses again. So. Yeah, that would be great. That would be really nice. <laughs> All right. Uh, Thanks, everybody, for listening, and we'll see you next week.